dear friends, what a privilege it is to be with you again. I want to welcome you to week number six of our study in the book of Mark. I hope you have been blessed by it. I think this week will offer us another beautiful picture of who Jesus is uh, by learning about the miracles that he performed. Some of them. This week, we're studying miracles around the lake uh, in our study. Miracles that happened between Mark chapter four and Mark chapter six. And I am thrilled anytime I get to look at the miracle working power of Jesus. My name is Dwayne Esmond, and I welcome you to join me as we walk this week. And let me tell you, there's nothing like the miracles of Jesus to help encourage us that he can still do those miracles in our lives. Amen. Well, our scripture reading, our memory verse comes to us from Mark chapter 5 and verse 19, which says this. However, Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. Don't tell anybody. Just go home and just tell people what Jesus has done for you. Don't speak it now. Tell them later. And that's a beautiful reminder of what we are to do. God has called us to tell people the good things that he has done for us. Uh, when Jesus does something for us and has compassion on us, we ought to say something. Amen. Well, Sunday's lesson takes us immediately into a powerful story that you have probably heard many times before. It's in Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41. And the Bible tells us there that as the disciples, Jesus had been ministering all day. And then, then the scripture says that the disciples took him as he was, as he was. He was exhausted. He was tired. And in the evening, after teaching from, from the boat to the multitudes that were right on the shore, Jesus falls asleep immediately in the, in the boat and a great wind, a great gale force wind and storm arises on the Lake of Galilee. And let me tell you, I've been on that lake. I know those winds and I can tell you without a doubt, they come up very, they can come up very fiercely and very strong. And, uh, and Jesus is asleep. He's calm. He is resting. Even as water begins to fill the boat, the disciples are panicked and they, they wake him up and say, Master, don't you even care about us? Don't you care that we are perishing? Jesus simply says to the wind and the waves, be still, hush, be quiet now, and they calm down. The disciples are incredulous as they watch this scene, as the waves come right back down. Jesus then says to them, why are you so worried? Have you no faith? What happened to your faith? You've been with me now for a while. What's, what's wrong with your faith? Why is your faith defective? Jesus was not mocking them. He was simply saying to them, listen, I'm in the boat with you. And nothing can happen to you while I'm here with you. Trust in me. And the same is true of us. This is what's called a theophany or partial theophany, which we'll learn in this week's lesson. A theophany has five parts. It has a display of divine power. It has human fear. It has a command not to fear. It has, number four, a revelation of the of, of, of God, of who God is in the appearance. And then number five, a human response to the to the revelation. And here we have four of the five. We have Jesus calming. We have Jesus telling them not to fear. We have the disciples incredulous saying, what in the world is going on? And we have a hint in the last part. Uh, uh, we have a hint at the end of this revelation of who God is when the disciples wonder, who is it that can calm the winds and the waves? What kind of person is this? Beloved, it's all telling us one simple story. We've got Jesus. Jesus in the boat and we can trust him. May God bless us in our study today. Hello, friends. Can you hear a whisper above a shout? Can you hear a whisper above a shout? That's our study today. My name is Dwayne. Once again, we are studying this week miracles around the lake, the lake of uh, Galilee that Jesus performed. And today's story is one of those that I absolutely love in the Bible. I'm so glad this story is in the Bible uh, because it reminds us that Jesus can hear things that we can't. Uh, the scripture tells us in Mark chapter 5, verses 1 to 20 of a man who is demon possessed. Jesus now has come across the lake. He's quieted the winds and the waves. And now he comes to quiet the winds and waves in this man. He meets him right at the shore in a place called the Gadarenes. A man is there howling in the night. They probably heard him before they even got to the shore. The Bible says that he could not be bound, not even with chains. No one could subdue him. He would cut himself in the middle of the night and scream. Uh, when when he arrives, when Jesus arrives at the shore, the Bible says Jesus is whispering, come out of him, come out of him, come out of him. The man runs to Jesus, falls down and worships him. 
Can you imagine what kind of worship service is it when you've got a legion of demons in you? When Jesus asked the man, what is his name? His demons answer for him. Have your demons ever answered for you? Sometimes the things in us that are not right, the things that are so broken in us answer for us. They speak for us uh, in the way that we act or in the way that we live or in the things that we say. Sometimes there are things we don't want to say or don't want to do, but our demons, our, our behaviors that are not like God, sometimes those things speak for us. But Jesus hears the whisper of this broken human heart high above the pronouncements of the demons that are in him, the shouts of the demons. They recognize Jesus. They said, hey, what have we to do with you? Why, well, why are you here to torment us, says the demons? Why, why are you tormenting us now? Just leave us alone. Permit us to go into, you know, into these swine, this herd of swine on the, on the hillside. And Jesus permits them to go. They go into the swine and immediately the swine run off a cliff and, and they're drowned in the water. Uh, it is a financial disaster for the people who own that herd. And they're upset. They want Jesus to leave. It's an unbelievable scene. They want Jesus to leave. But the man who is transformed does not want to leave Jesus. He says, listen, would you mind if I just go with you, if I just continue with you? But sometimes we can't, you know, it would be nice if we could just stay in the temple or stay in the church or stay in the place where God has touched our lives. But God calls us to go, to go out and share with people the good things that he has done for us, the compassion that he has had on us. That's where our memory scripture comes from for this week. Jesus tells him, go, be a witness for me. Let people know what I have done for you. The wonderful thing about this powerful study today is that Jesus confronts the devil. It's a many great controversy. And once again, Jesus wins. No matter what the controversy is within us, if we can just bring it to Jesus, no matter what's in us, if we can just come to Jesus, Jesus can free us from the shackles of the enemy and he will win. God bless you. Hello, beloved friends of God. Do you like a good roller coaster ride? Do you like perhaps going to an amusement park? And have you been on one of those rides to take you up and down and everywhere? Well, come with me today. My name is Dwayne. Come with me today because we're going on a roller coaster ride with Jesus. That's our study for today. Two wonderful stories from Mark chapter 5, verses 21, all the way to about 43. We encounter Jesus in two very touching, touching situations. The first tells us of a man named Jairus, a, 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 an official of the synagogue. Now, officials of the synagogue were not really friends of Jesus. In fact, in Mark chapter 1 and verse 22, we learn that Jesus taught with authority, not like them. So that separated Jesus by himself, that he was a man of authority. And when he taught, miracles and power followed and the people saw the difference. So that didn't endear him to the scribes and the Pharisees. But then the Bible says in Mark chapter 3, Mark chapter 3, uh, verses 1 to 6, that when he healed someone in the synagogue, the, 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 the scribes and the Pharisees were indignant. They were so upset that they went out and plotted to plot his murder. But in this story, we find in Mark, beginning in Mark chapter 5, verses 21, there is Jairus, a synagogue official who comes to Jesus by the seaside and is imploring Jesus to come to his house that he might heal his daughter. He's got a sick daughter who is dying, but he has faith. He's desperate for help from Jesus. Have you ever been desperate for help from Jesus, that Jesus will do something for you uh, that you have a great need for? That's Jairus. He's desperate, begging Jesus, please help me. Jesus begins to go to his house. Now he's got Peter, James, and John with him, but he's interrupted. He's interrupted, the Bible says, by another woman uh, who comes in behind him. The Bible says that for 12 years, she's had an issue with blood. She's been bleeding and bleeding that won't stop. Now, in the book of Leviticus, the Bible tells us what this is like. To have an issue of blood meant that she was unclean. It meant that she anything she touched, people had to clean after she left. She could not hug people. If she hugged someone or touched someone, they were unclean. And they had to be, they had to cleanse themselves and be separated for seven days uh, from the rest of the community. It was a devastating diagnosis that she had. But she concentrated, Ellen White says in the book, Desire of Ages, she concentrated all of her faith into one touch. And when she touched the very hem of Jesus' garment, she was healed. Have you touched Jesus lately? Healing virtue went out of Jesus. And he asked, who touched me? Who touched me? Of course, everybody's around him. But Jesus perceives that virtue had left him. 
He wasn't, he wasn't going to scold her. Jesus wanted to free her, not just of her physical malady, but of any spiritual malady that she had as well. And this he does. Be of good courage. Your faith, your faith has made you whole, says Jesus to this woman with the issue of blood. But then Jesus continues on to Jairus' house. He doesn't forget Jairus. When he gets there, the mourners, all the paid mourners are screaming and making noise. Jesus clears them out, goes into the room of this precious little one that has now died and calls her back to life, Talitha Kumai. Jesus says, little girl, little lamb, come back to life. Ah, I'm so excited today that Jesus can still call dead things back to life. He still calls dead people back to life. And he wants us not just to, to be well, but to prosper in our souls and in our spiritual lives as well. He calls us back to spiritual life and physical life. May we experience that today. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and let us be glad in it. Today, our study takes us in one Wednesday to uh, a theme, the themes of reception and rejection, reception and rejection. And today's study is a heavy study. It's a painful study uh, because amid the miracles that Jesus is performing, uh, we see the ultimate sacrifice being paid by a faithful servant of God. Um we're still in the book of Mark. We're in the book of Mark, Mark chapter six, uh, to be exact. And the Bible tells us that Jesus is ministering, but now he sends out the 12. He sends them out to do ministry. He equips them. And I love the way the Bible says, he tells them, listen, you go out, don't take anything with you. In fact, the people you minister to will supply your needs. God will, will speak to them, will touch them, and they will give you what you need in terms of food and other things that you may need as you go. What's important is that you have the essential equipment to go. What you need is my power and my authority. And I'm giving you that. I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves, that God's message will be preached, the message of repentance, the kingdom of God being at hand. That's what you are called to proclaim and to share. And I will be with you. And in the process, heal, heal diseases, cast out demons. God empowers them. And notice they are not perfect. They are not finished products, but God empowers them anyway to do ministry. I'm so touched and moved by that reality that God is giving his power and his authority to unfinished uh human beings who are still learning to, and coming to an understanding of who they are in Christ. Well, something happens in the middle of this story. The Bible says word gets back to, to uh, King Herod, and he is amazed uh, by what he is hearing. It seems as though uh, John, uh, that John the Baptist is alive and, and, and well again. He hears the, the exploits being done by these uh, Jesus's disciples and by Jesus himself. And he thinks, you know, I thought I, I had already killed John, uh, but John is back again. He's risen again. The same, I'm hearing the same sermon. I'm, I'm, I'm seeing the same manifestation of power. Something is wrong with what's going on. And then we are told exactly how Jan, John the Baptist dies, that Herod is trying to have his brother Philip's wife and John was preaching against that. He didn't like the fact that John was telling him about his sin and publicizing it. And so he had Herod killed, uh, Herodias' daughter. Uh, this is this is Philip's wife now, the one who wants, who, who the king wants. Uh, her daughter dances before the king and the king is, is amused and taken, taken aback. I mean, he's, he enjoys the scene and he's caught up in the moment and he offers this girl up to half his kingdom. And she says, you know what? I've got just the thing. I want John the Baptist's head on a charger. And Herod sends out his executioners. They kill him. They bring back that head on a charger and she presents it to her mother. The deed is done. John is gone. And they believe now that they are free. But that moment was a crystallization of their rejection of God's appeal to them. That even as multitudes were accepting Jesus Christ and being healed and changed, Herod rejected Jesus. His paramour rejected Jesus and they were lost. In this moment of time, God is reminding us there are moments when we get to, to receive him and then those moments close. May God help us to always be receptive to the speaking of the Holy Spirit. Hi friends, it's Thursday. We're going to talk today about a different kind of Messiah. Ooh, it gives me chills just thinking about the things that Jesus did and said and how he operated. Listen to this, Mark 
chapter 6 and verse 37. But he answered and said to them, you, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go in uh, and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. Jesus tells them, yeah, I see the 5,000 men, not counting women and children on the seashore, uh, waiting for something to eat. They had arrived at that seashore uh, early and listened as Jesus taught his disciples. The disciples had, had just returned from their missionary journey, and Jesus was taking them into a remote part of northern uh, Galilee in order to rest. But the disciples and Jesus would get no rest because the crowd found them. They were found out. The crowd met them on the shore. Uh, but the Bible only mentions 5,000 men here. It's almost as if uh, uh, there's, there's a military overtone here. They believe Jesus, again, is, is the Messiah, is, is, is a conquering king who has come to release them from Roman oppression and Roman occupation. And that would explain why only men are mentioned. Is Jesus going to raise an army, uh, you know, like some military general and lead them in revolt against uh, against uh, their 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 occupiers against their oppressors and no jesus doesn't come for this purpose jesus comes to liberate them from the bondage of sin from the oppression of the enemy of our souls that's what jesus is really about but in this story what's what's wonderful is jesus tells the disciples listen you just came back from you know you've seen people healed you've raised the dead you've cast out demons surely feeding this multitude should not should not worry you uh should not bother you but they did not know what to do so Jesus says, go get, you know, any loaves and fishes. See, see what food is available. And let's start with that. When they come, when they return with a little boy's lunch, we're told another part of the, of the, of the, of the story. They return with a little boy's lunch. The Bible says they've got five loaves and two fish. And Jesus looks up to heaven now, blesses it because he knows what his father is going to do. All he needs to do is thank God for what he's going to do. Uh, you know, some things Jesus wants to do for us. We really don't need to pray for it. We need to just thank him for doing it. But Jesus is in turn with his father, in, in, in tune with his father and knows what he's about to do. And he says to him, you know, I thank you, Lord, for for blessing us with this this meal. Now multiply it. And he begins to break it and it multiplies. It feeds that entire multitude. Later that night, Jesus sends them away again to go get some rest as he disperses the multitude. He's going to get some rest after the, the crowd is gone. And he sees them on the lake, buffeted by winds and waves again, troubled. The Bible says he comes to them walking on the water in the fourth darkest part of the night, right before dawn. He comes on the water to them. They are absolutely afraid, but he says to them, don't be afraid. It's me. It's just me. They thought they had seen a ghost, but that ghost was not a ghost. It was Jesus himself walking on the water, coming to them to rescue them. What a blessing it is that Jesus didn't just send them away, but he watched them all the way. His eye was still on them as they were as they were traversing and traveling on that waters. On the waters of life, Jesus is still watching us. Through the ups and the downs, the winds and the waves of our lives, Jesus is still watching us. And Jesus will come to us in our hour of need. Thank you, God, for this different kind of Messiah. Hello, dear friends. Once again, we want to say thank you to Jesus for being with us this week in our study. I hope you have been encouraged by the miracle working power of Jesus. My name is Duane, and I want to say unequivocally, I was encouraged this week and I thank God so much for the stories, the miracles of Jesus around the Lake of Galilee. Our memory scripture reminded us again, told us again of how after Jesus had healed the demoniac, he bid him not to say anything in the place where he was. There was already enough tension there uh, as we learned this week, but go back, go home. Share with people the great compassion that God has had on you and the miracle working power of God upon your life. Go back to the place where you live and move and have your being and there tell people about Jesus. That's what God is calling us to do after he's done great things for us. We ought to go back. We learn that he can calm storms, that he can speak to the winds and the waves in our lives, that he could come walking on the winds and the waves, walking on the water to us. No matter how choppy the seas of our lives, Jesus can calm it. And when the seas and the water doesn't calm, when it doesn't calm down, Jesus will come be with us and calm us in the middle of the storm. We learned 
that sometimes you can go home and be rejected. The Bible tells us that he went to Nazareth and could do no miracle there. Just maybe a few folk were healed and, and helped because of the unbelief of those of his own city where he lived and grew up and, and, and was his hometown. Sometimes the people who love us and know us best, the people we've grown up around are unbelievers in what God is doing in our lives. That's not a reason to stop. Sometimes it means that we've got to go other places to do ministry for, for God. We learned this week that Jesus understood the emotional roller coaster of pain and suffering that people sometimes are on, of Jairus, the death or dying of his precious daughter, and then even her eventual death, of this woman with the issue of blood, the emotional pain of searching for a solution in every way, going to doctors and trying everything she could only to get worse. Ah, uh, but then coming in the press behind Jesus and touching his garment, being healed by him. Jairus, anxious by this sandwich story, this interruption of his miracle uh, as Jesus is going to his house. But Jesus doesn't stop because of the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus continues to Jairus' house and eventually brings his daughter back to life. Miracle after miracle, exposing, unfolding who Jesus is. There is running through here this idea of, of secrecy, of Jesus not wanting everyone to know yet who he is. But with every passing miracle, Jesus cannot remain incognito. Jesus, in his manifestation of power and teaching, he tells people over and over again that he is the Messiah come down to earth to seek and save the lost. Well, we thank God for the miracles of Jesus, but they remind us that his power is undimmed, that Jesus has not changed, that that which he did for people a long time ago, he wants to do for us today. And may God help us to take these truths into our hearts and to remember that the miracle working, saving power of Jesus is not just for that time, it's for our time. May he transform us as we go into this new week. May God bless you.